Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 251st episode of the CodeCast Podcast. My name is Terry Fletcher. So today I'm going to get back to basics and talk coding. I'm actually going to focus on some ICD-10 coding where I'm seeing there's maybe some confusion or maybe some misunderstandings when it comes to certain diagnoses. And I'm going to pick a few just so that you can have some language, maybe some understanding, and just want to get back to basics in explaining what certain diagnoses um, would mean as you're looking up some of these services. Also, one of your best tools that you could ever use, it's a free tool, it's updated, and it's updated well by not only the CDC, but also um, the World Health Organization, and it is the ICD-10data.com. It's very, very good. Now, once you pull up a code, you want to verify it in your actual ICD-10 CM book, but just know that you have that free tool online that uh, you can Google. Again, ICD-10data.com, that can help you. So what I want to do is I wanted to start with the migraine diagnosing because I've noticed that in my audits, some of these are being coded, but they're not actually being uh, coded correctly. And some of the terms that the physicians are using, um, it's, it's just clear in the record that maybe it's not translating to the correct code. So ICD-10 currently cl- contains more than 40 migraine diagnoses. The G43, that's a category, It contains subcategories that further define the type of migraine. Additional digits are also required to indicate intractable, non-intractable, with or without aura, with or without status of migraine assist. So that's migraine, O-S-U-S. The word refractory or intractable, that indicates a migraine does not respond to standard treatments. So some terms that are considered equivalent or equal to intractable, you may have seen in a record, uh, pharmacoresistant, so that means pharmacologically resistant to medication, treatment resistant, refractory, medically, and poorly controlled. So when your physician or another clinician in your practice documents migraine assess, this indicates that the patient has a severe refractory migraine that has lasted at least 72 hours. So migraine with aura may be documented in a variety of ways, including classical migraine, basilar migraine, migraine with transient neurological phenomena, and retinal migraine. It is also appropriate to code any kind of migraine with aura when the patient has the aura without a headache. So remember that as a coder, you cannot infer the migraine sub migraine subterms from the chart. The clinician must document this information in the record to select the code. And again, your coding is going to start at the G43 category. So just a few coding examples, a migraine with aura would be G43.1, a migraine with R not intractable, G43.10, and then migraine with R intractable, G43.11. And the list continues as far as adding uh, digits to those diagnoses. So make sure you're looking for the status, specific status, or you will need to query your physician because it may not be coded correctly. Okay, now I want to switch and kind of pivot. As you know, one of my primary specialties is cardiology. And I always like to look at definitions from the computer of the heart. And so heart problems, which we call heart arrhythmias, this is when the electrical impulses that coordinate the heartbeats don't work properly. So the heart will either beat too fast or too slow or what we call irregularly. So heart arrhythmias, and it's arrhythmia, may feel like a fluttering or racing heart, and it could be harmless, but some can also be life-threatening, and that's when uh, we start to treat those irregular heartbeats. So doctors classify arrhythmias not only where they originate, so which could be the atria or the ventricles, but also the speed of the heart rate they cause. So when you see something that says tachycardia, this is a fast heartbeat. So a resting heart rate greater than 100 beats a minute. When you see something called bradycardia, this refers to a slow heartbeat. 
So a resting heart rate less than 60 beats a minute. Now remember, there's going to be some variations because if a patient is exercising, it's normal to develop a fast heartbeat as the heart speeds up to provide internal tissues with more oxygen-rich um, blood. And then, of course, during the sleep times or times of relaxation, it's not unusual for your heartbeat to be slower. But your physician is the one who determines when it is irregular. So, for example, atrial fibrillation. Now, this is that rapid heartbeat that we were talking about that refers to uh, chaotic electrical impulses in the atria. So this is where we could possibly have some weak situations. That code co or that coding series starts at I48.0, and you're going to need a lot of um, extra digits to explain, like A flutter, supraventricular tachycardia, um, which is above the ventricles, um, and there's different syndromes as well that you want to be aware of there. Then we have to look at uh, tachycardia is occurring in the ventricles. That's when you get into ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. Then when we talked about the bradycardia or slow heartbeat, so this is a little bit different because this also is when you get into that sick sinus syndrome because when this is your sinus node is responsible for setting the pace of your heart. So again, that's why I call it the computer. If it's not sending impulses properly, then your heart rate may alternate between too slow, bradycardia, or too fast, tachycardia. And a lot of times you're seeing this because of scarring near the sinus node, and that can cause slowing because there's a, a disruption or a blocking of those travel impulses. So you find this most of the time in older adults. And so I just wanted to, you to be aware of where to start, where to look, and kind of the language behind some of these uh, diagnoses. And so migraines, we're dealing with arrhythmias or abnormalities. And the next one I kind of wanted to just touch on, or should I say the next topic I, topic I kind of wanted to touch on, um, would be signer symptoms versus definitive diagnoses. There's such a controversy out there. And you have to go to the general guidelines to figure out when you can keep your signer symptoms and when you have to move on to the definitive diagnosis. Well, the rules are that once your physician from an evaluative service has determined what the end result is, so has determined that the patient, let's say they come in with, with um, knee pain, but they determine it's osteoarthritis, then you code to the highest degree of certainty of what you have, so the highest degree of detail. But if you don't know and you're still trying to figure it out from diagnostics and um, testing and things like that, then you can stick to those signer symptoms. That's why when a patient comes in, with an uh, evaluation and management service that leads, let's say, to a heart cath or leads to a colonoscopy or leads to an injection service. And we're trying to use that 25 modifier. It's helpful because we can use our signer symptoms on the ENM service because we're still not sure with what's going on with that patient. We're, we're dealing with, and of course, chief complaint, the complaints. And then once we figure it out and the doctor knows, then we get definitive and how we're coding something. It would be like trying to code for cancer without first doing a biopsy or something like that. You, you meant never assumptive code. Okay, well, only in COVID apparently, but everything else you want to make sure you're first looking at the signer symptoms and then you move on to anything after that. Now, would you code a signer symptom with a definitive diagnosis if those signer symptoms are part of that full definitive syndrome disease process that diagnosis? No, you would then leave them off. And so just so you know, it's what leads to it and it's either or. So I always like to, to try to get back to basics sometimes because there are days when I'm looking at some of these services and thinking, oh my goodness, this is really just not good and we just need to kind of take a step back and make sure that we are coding correctly. Another thing that came up recently, and I appreciate Char in uh, Illinois, so she was, she's was she been a long time uh, Coding Corner client and also a good friend of mine now and I used to take my live seminars all the time. 
And actually, even a fun little tidbit is that she used to take me to the airport after a live seminar. Haven't seen her in a couple of years, but we still keep in touch through uh, LinkedIn and uh, different webinars that um, I'm able to, to uh, tackle and, and speak on. But my point is, is that she sent me a question. I thought this was a great question. So when you're dealing with transitional care management, if you're going to be participating in those services, can a nurse from the hospital be the first 48 hour contact with the patient versus somebody who works for the physician or the physician. Remember, this is a transition into the patients, they call it community. So it would be their domicile, their skilled nursing, their home, their assisted living, wherever they're moving on to from that hospital service. You cannot include a clinician that is not part of the billing provider's clinical staff. Now, who should be the one that does that initial contact on TCM? It should be the physician or qualified healthcare provider that has a history and a knowledge of that patient's care when they're transitioning. It shouldn't be, in my opinion, an RN, a medical assistant, or anything. And it, it is a little gray only because they can't answer or respond to medical decision questions. So you have a patient coming out of the hospital from let's say a long-term stay and they have questions on their orthopedic physician, maybe they were a, a hip surgery patient or they're a COPD patient and they have questions that take a medical decision, a medical assistant can't respond to that, but a medical um, physician obviously or a qualified healthcare provider that can bill independently, always look at it that way, to the payer, they can. So that should be your first point of contact. And again, it's somebody who is directly involved in the reporting or billing of these services to the actual payer. So I've had a recent coding question that I think there's some confusion as well, and this is CPT now, when it comes to closure devices for either heart caths or when you are performing a lower extremity intervention or um, even a, you know, a coronary intervention or anything like that, you cannot charge to close the vessel. You open the vessel, close it. Okay, it's, it's part of what you do. It's an inherent part of that service. It even says that in CPT. Is there an exception? Yes. And this is where my coding question comes. It says, Terry, we were told that we could actually bill for a closure device when providing for coronary services. Let's clarify. You may have heard the acronym EVAR, okay? EVAR means that you are dealing with an endovascular repair of a patient who has an aneurysm, AAA, or a pseudoaneurysm. And what happens in those percutaneous accesses and closures is that the delivery of the endograph is through a large sheath and it is a 12 French or larger, usually it's 18, or larger sheath. And you do get to code that per side that you access. So if it's in the right common femoral or and or left common femoral, yes, the three the add-on code 34713 would be added to, let's say, a 34703 which is the endovascular repair of the infrarenal aorta and or iliac arteries by deployment of an aorta unit iliac endograph. Now, just know that this is the only time that you actually can capture that. If you're you know, using a device or closure device that is for a lower extremity intervention or for a coronary intervention, heart cath, anything, that's included. So you have to really read the um, directions, I guess, or the details around each procedure to make sure that you're not overcoding those. I'm starting to see those add-on codes with the wrong uh, procedure codes, and I'm just like, oh my gosh. And one thing that's really helpful is that if you look at some of the add-on codes, it'll tell you what not to code it with, and it'll tell you, or or you'll get in parenthetic uh, parenthetical item underneath, it'll say use in conjunction with. And if your code isn't on there, then you can't use it. And so because you wouldn't have grounds for an appeal, and obviously there's a place in the CBT book that says it's uh, bundled. Our coding question today is brought to you by Gold Bond Ultimate Healing. Aloe for skin that's nourished, healed, and healthy looking. Gold Bond Ultimate Skin Therapy Lotion. So my personal tidbit today is going to be a public service announcement. <laughs> First of all, if you have a husband or a partner or kids or whatever, I'm sure many of you have dealt with this, you need to go to Amazon and get the three squirt bottle package of Shout and put it next to the nightstand or next to wherever your hamper is. Put one on where the, the uh, you keep your washer and dryer and make sure you put it though by where they put their clothes 
and tell your family, and I'm going to call out my husband here, to shout. So basically squirt that stuff on any stain in your shirt or anywhere so that we can get it out. It does not magically come out. Second, make sure that when you take off your clothes, turn them the right way. Okay. Do not turn them inside out. I know you think in the dryer, there's a leprechaun in there who's turning clothes the right way, but it takes twice the time to fold laundry. So please stop doing that. And also the only way to get toothpaste out of a shirt would be to either shout it or you have to use rubbing alcohol and then wash it. And that smells terrible. So make sure that <laughs> your public service announcement today is heard. And I'm going to do a last one only because I'm on a rant. And hopefully this will provide you either some comic relief or many of you out there, if you have a husband or a male partner, you'll be like, oh my gosh, Terry, you hit the nail on the head here. So just so you know, the reason we have you lift the toilet seat up is because you drip all over the one that the women sit on. But lifting it up and then dripping on the other part of it doesn't mean that then you put it down without wiping it down the seat. It's not to hide it. So stop doing that. For those of us that do have house cleaners or housekeepers that come once a week, yeah, we're still cleaning toilets like four to five times a week because of dripping, okay? Knock it off. Feel free to do that, but then wipe your own toilet seat for crying out loud. Okay, I'm done ranting, but that's my public service announcements announcements for the week. How'd you like that? Yeah, some of you will be laughing. Some of you will be like, oh boy, Terry's, Terry's having a rant this week. Yes, I am. It was one of those weekends. Anyway, everyone, make it a great rest of your week. Make it a great day. And thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, Follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma, music producer Assassin Music.